Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Faith Community Church. We're so glad you could join us today. Uh, we're going to start the service with some praise and worship. Um, our first song is Do Lord, Oh Do Lord, Remember Me. So you can stand and join us um, if you feel like it, or you can stay in your seat.
So uh, um, you're, everybody is invited to that. They would like to be there. Um, but I'll also give you a chance to leave if you need to do that too. Um, at, uh, after that time where we uh, have a chance to share together, we will have some refreshments in the uh, uh, Agape room uh, next door. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and so we'll, we'll, we'll have some refreshments there. Uh, so it's, it'll, it'll be another platform. Uh, maybe you're not as comfortable talking in a larger setting and you would be able to ask questions there uh, also in a more uh, in a more individual kind of kind of setting also so um, next week is the fourth Saturday of the month and we have the women's breakfast right here in the church I just went to the men's breakfast uh, yesterday it uh, is my second men's breakfast so I'm actually kind of feeling pretty initiated right now and uh, the, uh, the, it, it, they just put on a fabulous breakfast, and I know the ladies are going to, with their uh, team that are supporting them, are going to have a great breakfast this Saturday, 8.30 a.m. Wendy is going to be sharing. Wendy, why don't you wave so anybody just doesn't know you there right there, Wendy. And uh, what we need to survive. I may come. <laughs> Sounds like a really good topic. What we need to survive is what she's going to be speaking on. Uh, so that would be great, too. So if the ushers could prepare to receive the offering this morning, there's more than one way to give. You can give online or you can give right here in the service. But I wanted to share just a <coughs> scripture with you that I, I just thought was uh, was inspiring to me when I found it yesterday. Uh, 2 Corinthians 8, 7. This is what it said. But just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in your love for us, see that you also excel in the grace of giving. Isn't that great? It's like Paul is leaving a challenge to uh, the church, and he and he's speaking to them. He says, "He says, just as you excel in everything, you're doing a good job." He said, "In faith, we." we we all think, oh yeah, we should excel in faith. In speech, yes, okay, good. In knowledge of the word, yeah, absolutely. We're in complete earnestness and in your love for us, just as you excel in all those different ways, he says, see that you also excel in the grace of giving. This isn't just my hobby horse. It's not just my <laughs> issue that I'm bringing up to you when I challenge you in this area. This is one of the fundamental issues in our lives that puts us on our right standing. Um, uh, it doesn't improve our standing before God, but it, it improves our ability to be successful in life when we, when we manage this and we learn the secret of giving. So he says, see that you also excel in the grace of giving. Lord, I just uh, come before you right now and I ask for us that we would excel in all the areas that are talked about here, but that we would excel also in the grace of giving. Let that thing flow in this church. Let people uh, acknowledge and say something, something so powerful is happening there. They're ex they excel in so many different areas, but also in the grace of giving. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Ushers, I'm going to ask you just to come, and we've got some little uh, bags here to pass along. <coughs> so, um, I want to talk with you today. Um, what I'm going to be sharing today, in some ways, is going to be a little bit of review of some of what we've talked about all during this last uh, this last uh, month and a half, two months that I've uh, been with you. Um, a little bit of a, re uh, of a review, I'm going to touch on some things that I've already talked on. Uh, reviewing is an important thing. The Bible, you'll, you'll see that over time, so you may even think to yourself, why do they keep repeating this? Uh, a teacher taught me long ago when I was learning how to teach others, <clears throat> they said repetition is the mother of learning, right? You have to have repetition if you're going to have learning. So we'll touch, touch on some of these things and talk about a little bit. But what I want to talk to you about, the t general title is this, 
how I manage my disappointments. And so I'm going to be speaking to you from a very personal basis today and talking about what I do. <coughs> just, just how do I manage when life delivers disappointments? How do I manage when that happens? I, in your notes, that, does everybody have notes that if you that wanted one, you pick them up on the way in? If you didn't, just lift your hand up right now and the ushers will give you one if you need, if you need one of these. Okay, great. So uh, in your notes, it says this, the definition of disappointment, sadness or displeasure caused by the non-fulfillment of one's hopes or expectations, right? All of us have experienced the sting of that. I, I wrote this line, I really like it here. It says this, like the fallen ice cream cone, the balloon that flies away, the job that never calls back, the second date that never comes, <coughs> the miscarriage of a baby, or the mission's opportunities that don't materialize, um, disappointment is a part of life. And that's just the reality. I can remember uh, my little son, my, my son told me now, it's like, <laughs> but anyway, my, my son told me when he was about eight years old, he'd gotten a balloon at some activity, a helium balloon, and I remember he was coming in the, he was coming in the doorway and the, and the balloon, you know, took off, flew away, and just, you know, you know, just a sense of loss that swept over him. And I, I know you felt that sense of loss. We all have uh, in our lives. Uh, John 16, 33, it says, These things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. This is Jesus speaking to us. He says, these things I've spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. Now, people deal with disappointment in different kinds of ways. I was uh, doing some research on this and studying it. Some people numb themselves with of other activities. They're not, they're, uh, this is in your notes too, uh, the blank there is numb. Numb themselves with other activities. Not, not um, uh, they don't want to really process or think about the disappointment, but they just fill their lives up with other stuff. Uh, sometimes people like this can become obsessive uh, in their hobbies, whether it's music or motorcycling. Uh, they can be obsessive in raising their children. They can uh, they, they just numb themselves by totally giving themselves over to something else. This is something that will fill their life so they don't have to think about the disappointment that they, that they feel. Some people are underachievers. And uh, that's the blank, they're underachievers. Some people seek to avoid disappointment by turning into underachievers. They unconsciously set the bar low and avoid taking any risk to present, pre prevent themselves or others from being disappointed. Without realizing that they have decided that the best strategy is not to have high, ex high expectations about anything. Such behavior turns into a form of self-preservation. However, it also leads to a mediocre and unfulfilled life. So we have people who numb themselves with activity. We have people who just say they, they were disappointed, so they just lower their expectations. They move it down. And then the third group that uh, was spoken about is perfectionism. Others follow a very different trajectory. They seek to avoid uh, disappointment by becoming overachievers. Although they tell themselves that their expectations of perfection are appropriate and realistic, their presumptions turn out not only to be uh, to not to be true at all. The bar is set far too high to ever make whatever they want to achieve attainable. They forget that perfectionism rarely begets perfection or satisfaction. Instead, it often leads to dis disappointment. So let me ask you, if I were to give you those three choices, uh, numb yourselves when you face disappointment, underachiever, or perfectionistic, what would you say your way of dealing with disappointment is? It varies. What's that? It varies. It varies. It's all three of them. All three of them, one time or another, that's good. <laughs> Maybe you just write on your on your notes just what you think your way of dealing with disappointment is. Where do you tip on these? Um, Winston Churchill, I thought this was a great quote from Winston Churchill's in your notes. It says this, 
Success is the ability to go from one failure to another with no loss of enthusiasm. <laughs> go from one failure to another with no loss of enthusiasm. That's a guy who, you know, he's, 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 he's good. How to manage my, or how to manage my disappointments, or how I manage my disappointments, maybe would be a better way to say it. Um, we, we see 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, it says, Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculation and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So, how do I manage my disappointments? First thing is, I say, okay, I am responsible to bring every thought captive to Christ. That's my, I have a job to do. I need to bring every thought captive to Christ. And, uh, and, and so I, over the years, I've developed some different ways, some different things that I do that help me to get my thoughts under control. Any of you ever pray a prayer that you wish your thoughts were a little more under control than they are? Right? You know what I'm talking about when things just start running crazy? Okay, so, so bringing our thoughts under control. So I, I've just learned some different tools, and that's what I'm going to share with you in our, in our time together today. Some different tools that over time I've just come to learn to help me get my, my, to bring my thoughts into obedience to Christ. Okay, first one is this using gratitude to reframe my thoughts. First Thessalonians 5.18 says, In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now so catch this picture. I'm in the mall, and I'm walking along in the mall, and you know, all the stores, they have glass, you know, windows in front of them, kind of going down as I'm walking in the mall. And as I'm walking along the mall, I'm looking over, and I see this old man. <coughs> and I think to myself, who is that old man? As I'm walking away, walking along. And and he's a little overweight, you know. And, who is this old man? And all once it dawns on me, that's me. <laughs> Reflected in the glass on, on, on the... On the what, what? And, and I start to feel a little depressed. Right? I start going, I'm an old fat man. Walking through the mall, you know, I, just, I was feeling good there for a moment, but I, you know, I started feeling a little bad. And so I'm walking through the mall, I'm feeling kind of down kind of thing. And then I see somebody coming the other way. And it's another old man. And he's got a t-shirt on. And his t-shirt says, aged to perfection. <laughs> aged to perfection. And I, all at once I go to myself, aged to perfection. That's me right there. Aged to perfection. I, I'm not an old fat man. I am... <laughs> An experienced guy who has been aged to perfection. See, that's the that's the, uh, the, the you, you know the guy that I am. So so what am I talking about? I'm talking about you. That that thing there that's happening right there as I'm describing this situation. This is something. This is where the battle is. You can live your life disappointed and defeated, and all this kind of thing. Or you can, through gratitude, you know, I start looking at myself and say, I, I, I'm not looking at my age now as a negative. I'm looking at my age as a positive. I'm looking at a person who has experience. I'm looking at a person who has the ability to observe and see patterns and, and make sure things don't go the wrong path, you know. Uh, just certain abilities that an older person has in the situation, and I be, I, and my gratitude for those things overtakes the negativity that was sweeping in my brain. Are you with me? Yeah. Age yeah. to perfection. The guy doesn't realize he saved me that day <laughs> you know, with that T-shirt. He really helped me. So, so, so this is something that that um, we have to realize that we have the ability 
to look at something and we can take the negative side of it or we can say, what is there in this thing that I can be thankful about and begin to celebrate that side of the experience, uh, you know, also. So, so um, this is, this is, I'm telling you how I manage my disappointments, how I manage the, the things that come after me. Okay, number two in your notes. Understanding that God's primary purpose is to grow you. So everything you go through, including the disappointments, God has a purpose for all that stuff. And uh, verse 29 says this, God knew what he was doing from the very beginning. He decided from the outset to shape the lives of those who love him along the same lines as the life of his son. The Son stands first in the line of humanity he restored. We see the original intended shape of our lives there in him. After God made that decision of what his children should be like, he followed it up by calling people by name. After he called them by name, he set them on a solid basis with himself. And then after getting them established, he stayed with them to the end gloriously completing what he had begun. So it's what this passage is saying, that's the message that I, I, I just read to you from Romans chapter 8, 29 through 30. What, what, what it's saying is God has a purpose and everything that touches our lives is not of his creation, but the wonder of his awesomeness is that he can take things that touch our lives that he didn't create. He, it was not his will or desire or anything else to make that pain touch your life. But he can take that, and if our hearts are right, if our spirits are right, if we understand his purposes, he can take that pain and actually use it to form the character of Christ in us, to make us more like Jesus. He works in us. Um, God never wastes a problem that you face. You know, he doesn't waste a tear that you've gone through. He will use it to form the character of Christ in you. And this is something you've got to come to believe, right? See, so when you're going through things, you've got to, you, you've got to make this leap of belief where when this pain touches you, when this thing is affecting you, that you say, my God is bigger than the pain. My God is bigger than the problem. My God is bigger than all of this. And if, if this is being allowed to touch me, God has a good intention. He has a desire to change me and to make me into the person that he wants me to be. And he's not going to waste any problem. He's not going to waste any pain. He's not going to waste any tear. If my attitude is right, if I, you know, if I flip into bitterness and anger and all that. yeah then you then you get wailing but if you keep your spirit right if you keep your attitude right if you're looking to Christ and you're saying I'm trusting you to finish what you have begun in me and that you're going to use everything that touches me good and bad to make me more like you as it talks about in this passage the intended shape of our lives there in him it, 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 I, I'm going to trust you with that. And I, and I believe that. I've just come over time that, that I believe that nothing touches me, that God, and he doesn't necessarily create everything that touches me, right? Sometimes I, things touch me because I'm stupid, right? I do stupid things. And, you know, sometimes things touch me, uh, hurt me because somebody else is trying to hurt me. Sometimes it's the enemy coming against me. It's all these different things, but anything that touches me, I don't focus on that thing. I look above that to God, and I say, Lord, you're in control of everything. You're in control of it all, and I believe that if you're allowing this to touch me, that you are going to use it to form and to shape the character of Christ in me. So I'm going to just rest in that. I'm going to trust in that. And this, this comes to our, our next point, which has to do with Trusting in the wisdom of God. I think I shared with you this with you a few weeks ago, this thought. Let the name of God be blessed forever and ever, for wisdom and power belong to him. And this is what the 
This is, this is the passage, the, the little quote right here I want you to get a hold of. The wisdom of God tells us that God will bring about the best possible results by the best possible means for the most possible people for the longest possible time. Look, look at that with me again. As a matter of fact, read it with me. To, to say it with me. Look at it. Read it. The wisdom of God tells us that God will bring about the best possible results by the best possible means for the most possible people for the longest possible time. The one with the greatest wisdom and with the greatest power is working for the greatest good. This, what this says to us is this. If I understood everything God was doing, I would say, Awesome. That's exactly the right thing to do. I mean, if you're like if you're like me going through life, some things you look at and you you know okay, and some things you look at and you think to yourself, I don't understand that. I don't understand how that happens. I can't. What, how, how is that? How is that possible? What, what you know? Where is God? What you know? What's happening? Right. But the wisdom of God lifts you above that. When you believe in the wisdom of God. And you'll, you say this, I look at this, I don't understand what's happening, but I know that if I knew everything that God knows, I, could, I would be able to find peace in the middle of this situation. And so I'm going to trust in the wisdom of God. That God knows what he's doing, and, I, I, and, and, and he, I, I'm trusting that he, what, everything he's doing is trying to bring about the best possible results for the be, by the best possible means for the most possible people for the longest possible time. And, uh, and, and so I, I just step back and I just say, I'm trusting in your wisdom, Lord. I don't know why you're allowing this. I don't know what's going on. But my trust is in your wisdom. You know, sometimes you have... Uh, people that pass away uh, and you're, you know, maybe they haven't, you know, given their lives to Christ, or at least you don't know what they've done or haven't done. You don't know what the last moments of their lives held or what the situation, and you can, you can be like all anxious. I'm telling you, there's nobody, you know, my mom's gone, but, but when, when I get to have, I don't know whether my father, my mother, I don't know whether they're, you know, they, they were kind of mixed up people. I don't know whether heaven, hell, I don't know what the... See, but I know this. When I stand before God and I know everything that He knows, I will look at what's happened and I will say, <coughs> you, knew what you, were do you were doing the best possible thing for the most possible people for the longest possible time. I trust in your wisdom. I rest in your wisdom. That is... These are the little... These are the little cornerstones I'm sharing with you. These are the fundamental things that I've had to come to through hard knocks, through smashing my head against the wall, through experiencing pain, suffering, loss, through different things. These are the things I've had to come to, come to that enable me to deal with the disappointments that life uh, delivers to us. Now, one thing I've learned to do is... Um, is what I would call self-talk. Do any of you talk to yourself? <laughs> I talk to myself like every day. As a matter of fact, before I go to bed at night, usually I talk to myself. I'm, I'm not talking about praying now, right? I'm talking me talking to me. I like get ready to lay my head down on the pillow, and my head is going, "What about church tomorrow?" What's going to happen? Are you going to say the right thing? Is this going on? And I, and I just lay my head down, and I go, and I go, tomorrow is going to be a good day. The Lord is with me. He is my strength. He's going to bring me through. It's going to come together. It's going to come together. Don't, Mike, relax. And I talk to myself. Yeah. Right? And it's, it's really good. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's like, I, like, I convinced, you, you know, I talked to myself, and I actually convinced myself, you know, it's going to be okay, just relax, you, well, you'll get up in the morning, there'll be enough time, don't be concerned, It'll all, all the pieces will be there, the car will start, all these things you're worried about, you know, it, it's going to all come together, it, it, he's with you, Mike, you're, you're okay, just relax, and then I lay my head down, and I go, okay, I can 
go to sleep. Right? I wrote down in your notes a list of different confessions that I made, some of the different self-talk that I talk to myself with. So here, here's some of them. These are some diff different things I say to myself. God knows what he's doing. Right? So I'm, I'm going into a situation, and, and it looks a little confusing, not sure what's going on. And I say to myself, God knows what he's doing. And then I, I got another one here. God's not trying to hurt me, but to bless me. Right? Something's happening. This is not to hurt me. This is to bless me. God's trying to help me. Um, God will make me better through this. I tell myself that. God will make me better through this. This is a difficult situation, but God will make me better. Another one I, I use is, I want to uh, be comfortable, but God wants me to grow. A lot of times I find that's the case, right? I want to be comfortable. I don't, I don't want these things to be happening, but God wants me to grow, so I'm going to trust in him that he's, he's going to put it all together. This is not a mistake. God will use this to change me. This isn't like, you know, God's up in heaven going, whoops, you know, when this problem falls on my life. Right? It's not like he's, he's like, whoa, 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 who let that happen? You know, it's, it, 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 you know, this is not a mistake. God will use this to change me. Uh, here's another one. God will not waste my pain. I'm going through some pain. God's not going to waste it. He's going to use it. What others have meant for evil, God has meant for good. I just, I just take that inside my heart. I, you know, some, sometimes there are nasty people in the world. They're trying to hurt you. What others have meant for evil, God has meant for good. He's going to use this in my life. God never promised me a trouble-free life. He promised to make me like Jesus. Yeah. Right? He never promised me a trouble-free life. He promised he would use it all to make me like Jesus. And, th and then this one. If I sow in tears... I will reap in joy. Okay, this may be a hard time, but if I stay faithful, if I sow in tears, I'm gonna, I'm gonna reap uh, with joy. So, so this, this I'm, t I'm just sharing you. I mean, I hope you feel. It. I'm just lifting the veil. This is the inner workings of a guy who's been around the gospel for 50 years and and has gone through some things, 50 something years, and has gone through some things. And this is how he copes, right? I'm, I'm showing you. That this is how I deal with the disappointments and the challenges that are in life. Uh, number four, separate goals from the underlying desires God has put in your heart. You know, sometimes we experience disappointment because we set certain goals and then those goals don't get fulfilled. And we don't realize that God's commitment is not necessarily to our goals. It's to the desires that he has put in our hearts. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him and he will do it. So what's it saying to us? It's saying... If we trust in the Lord, if we give ourselves to him, if we yield ourselves to him, he will give us the desires in our heart. So God puts certain desires in, inside of me to achieve certain things and go after. And so then I start setting some goals to try and go after these things that he's put inside my heart. And as I begin to pursue them, Sometimes everything goes great, and it's like, whoa, that was awesome. Sometimes the goal blows up. It doesn't, I don't achieve it. Things don't move forward. And then I have to drop back, and I have to say, okay, what was the desire that he put in my heart, right? And I tried to do it a certain way. I thought this was the right way to go, but the, but, but what I really need to do is to reconnect with the desire and make a new goal now in light of the desire, realizing that the way that I was going, God was not blessing. That's, he's not in that, you know, that path. Uh, even though it was in line with my desire, it was, that was not the way he wants to fulfill it. He wants to do this in another way. And so um, 
and in your notes it says, goals are tools that we use to move uh, toward our deepest desires. God changes, God, the goals change, but the desires endure. Reconnect with your desires and rewrite your goals for the new situation you're in. I shared this um, a little while ago with a movement of uh, young people that had gotten involved, it was called Campus Target, had gotten involved with um, going to China. They've, they've been doing ministry in China. This was a movement of uh, college age people. They, they would travel to China, do ministry in China. There were, there were about 60 of them, but when COVID hit and everything went crazy, they got thrown out of the country. The whole ministry got shut down. And so here were these 60 kids who, who had, they really wanted to do something in China. They really felt that that was, the, that was their desire. But that door was completely closed. And so I exhorted them. What, I, what I'm telling you is what I told them. I said, okay, you've got to stop now. <coughs> this door has closed, but you've got to go back to the desire that's in your heart. What's the longing that's inside of you? What is it that God has put in you? that desire he's put inside of you. And you need to now create a new goal. So these people now, the 60, they're, they're going to Morocco, they're going to Thailand, they're going to all kinds of different places around the world because they've stepped back and they've said, okay, God put a certain passion in us. We thought this was the way to fulfill it. But obviously this door is shut now. What is the way God wants us to move forward? And they're creating new goals and stepping out in those new goals and seeing some blessing and grace and, and, and good things uh, happening in their situation. Number five, honor God above your expectations, right? So we cannot let our failed expectations our disappointments cause us to lose our faith in God. you got to honor God. It, 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 uh, here's the famous passage from Habakkuk. Though the fig tree should not blossom, and there be no fruit on the vine, though the yield of the olive should fail, and, fail, and the fields produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the fold, and there be no cattle in the stalls, yet... I will exalt in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. So he's making this commitment. All these different things that you would be looking good things to happen. You know, the fig tree blossoming and the fruit on the vines. and All, all of this is failing. And he says, even though all of my expectations are failing, yet I will exalt in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. He says, I'm not going to let the fact that all these things have gone wrong, I'm not going to let that control my honoring of God and my trusting in God. The Lord God is my strength. He has made my feet like hinds feet and makes me walk on my high places. And when he says like hinds feet, he's talking about, you've seen these pictures of goats that are climbing up the sides of mountains and you're looking at it and you're thinking, what are they stepping on? They're little tiny crags and they're, they're coming up the edge of the, of, of the mountain. And, and, and come. He said, he's made my feet like hinds feet that I'm able to go up the mountain even though there's, it seems like there's nothing there for me to get a handle on. And yet he's making me able to climb to the top, right? Though the fig tree should not blossom and there be no fruit on the vines. You know, some of you that are here, maybe this is the season of life that you're in. Though the yield of the olive should fail and the fields produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the fold and there be no cattle in the stalls. Now listen, you can stop right there and you can become filled with bitterness. You can become filled with anger. You can become filled with disappointment, or you can say, you know what, my God is able to save me, but whether he does or not, I want everybody to know, I will exult in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. My, my exalting in God is not rooted in things going my way. My exalting in God is rooted in something else. And, and he's going to make my feet like high, hinds feet. And though the mountain seems impossible to get to the top of, I will rise in this situation because of God's work in my life. Amen. We see this same picture with the three Hebrew boys. 
he says, the, the, they're, they're speaking, they've been told you need to bow down or you're going to get thrown into a fiery furnace. You need to bow down right now. And this is what it says that they said. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire. He says, you know, if you decide to throw us into a furnace of blazing fire, our God can deliver us. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. <laughs> See, so, so, some of us, we're willing to commit to God as long as our expectations are met. But if disappointment comes on us, then we say, well, God, really, you know, he's, he, you know, he, he, you can't really trust in him. You can't really rest in him. You can't really believe in him. See, but these guys say, that they, they say, they say, our God is able to save us from, from your throwing us into this fire. He can save us from that. You, you, you don't have power o over him. But I want you to understand something. Even if he decides not to save me from this horrible pain, this situation, even if he decides that, I will not bow down. I'm not going to bow down to all these things that you're that you're trying to get me to worship and to and to put my you know hands on. And so and so so there's there's this thing that happens in us where where even when our expectations are not fulfilled, we've made there's this heart commitment. There's this heart decision that's been made that even when the disappointing things happen, we're going to trust in the wisdom of God, and we're going to we're going to we're going to look to Him in the midst of that situation, and and believe that He is going to finish the work that He's begun in us, and that maybe this pain is a part of it. You know, we're just going to trust. We're going to put our, our eyes on the Lord. This is how I. I process my my disappointments. I last week I shared with you the sixth um, the sixth little lesson, and I, I'll say it again for those that weren't here last week. I called it the the peak to peak principle, and uh, and the peak to peak principle says this. When is it time to make a change, right? Because sometimes people, if something bad happens, they think they need to quit. You know, if something bad happens, they say, you know, they're in the church, they don't like the way things are going, I'm out of here, right? I'm, I'm, I'm I, you know, I don't like the, this decision or that decision, I don't like what's happening, you know. I, but but there's, a, there's a secret that I've discovered, and that is this. When you're down in the valley in life, When you're down in the valley in life, that is not the time to make big decisions. And the reason is you can't, you can't see. You can't see what's going on. When you're surrounded by failed expectations, when disappointment <laughs> is clouding you up, when you're all you can't see. So if you make some kind of big change down here, there's a there's a big change, you're gonna regret that change. Because you're moving out of duress, so to speak. The time to make changes is when you're at the peak. When things are going good, you're feeling positive about what's happening. You can, and you, when, you're, when you're at the peak of a situation, you can see out in the distance and you can, you can, uh, you can help yourself. So it's the peak to peak principle. And so this is, again, when I'm struggling with disappointment, that's not times for me to make decisions, make big changes. Make me do so. You know, I'm just going to hold steady, right? I'm in the valley right now. The valley is for changing me. The mountaintop is for changing the situation. The valley is for changing me. The mountaintop is for changing the situation. <coughs> and then, last of all, you received in your notes a little thing that I wrote some time ago called the Code of Perseverance. I think it's, uh, is it green or yellow or yellow? It's a little yellow, yellow thing. Or, I, I did vote. 
Huh? It's green and or yellow. Oh, green and yellow. Okay, green and yellow. It says the code of perseverance on it. It's a half sheet of Little paper. Do you see it? Okay. I want you to do something with me. We're going to look at this. This is the. This is again one of the things that helps me when I'm dealing with disappointments. Is this these truths? I've gone over these truths so many times to get them in my head, so that when I'm in the middle of disappointments. So if you can stand, would you just stand up with that code right in your hands? And we're gonna we're going to um, we're gonna read it together. Okay, we're gonna read it together. And so what what I want what I'm gonna do is we're gonna read together. Like you see where it says number one, I will never give up. You know that part. We're gonna read that part together, and then I'll read the scripture to you. And then we'll go to number two. We'll read that together, and I'll read the scripture to you when we're over. Okay, are you with me? Okay. So here we go. Let's go. Let's go. Code of perseverance. Number one. I will never give up as long as I know I'm doing God's will. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Okay, together now. I believe that all things will work out for me if I hang on to my love for God and his purpose in my life. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Number three, I will be courageous and undismayed in the face of obstacles because the Lord is with me. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Number four. I will not permit anyone to intimidate me or deter me from my God-given goals. Philippians 1.28, in no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but, the salva but of salvation for you, and that too from God. Number five, I will try again and again and yet again to accomplish what I'm called to. The steps of a man are established by the Lord, and he delights in his way. When he falls, he shall not be hurled headlong, because the Lord is the one who holds his hand. Number six, I will take new faith and resolution from the knowledge that anyone who has accomplished anything for God has had to fight defeat and adversity. As an example, brethren, of the suffering and patience, take the prophet's who spoke in the name of the Lord. Number seven, I will put on the full armor of God, never surrendering to discouragement or despair, no matter what obstacles may confront me. Therefore, take up the full armor of God, that you may be able to resist in the evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. Number eight, I will not let my personal failures and sins keep me from finishing the race God has put me in. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witness surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Number nine. I will pray, not allowing my burdens or concerns to choke God's purposes in my life. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And then number ten. I will finish the race knowing that rewards are certain. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. The code of perseverance. That's good stuff, isn't it? Let's thank the Lord for that. Give me a hand. You are worthy, Lord. You are worthy. 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 Lord, I just pray for us right now that you will fill us with perseverance that you will fill us with the ability to face difficult challenges and difficult situations, that you'll give us that capacity to rise above, to be filled with um, the, the, the sense of your wisdom and trusting you, trusting in the wisdom of God. Let that just mark this place, Lord, forever. I thank you for it, Lord, a place where people are trusting. Not that everything will go good, 
but trusting that God is in control and his hand is over each of these situations. We thank you for it, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay, so um, you, can, yeah, you can sit down. Praise the Lord. And I'm going to take uh, just, why don't we just take a minute now? And if you would like to take off, we're going to take a, like a three, four minute break. If you need to take off, feel free to go. Otherwise, gap with people nearby you. And, uh, and then we'll come back together for, uh, for talking time. Yeah. Thank you.